Hey everyone, welcome back. This is part 2 of the super egg drop problem. In the last video, we discussed the super egg drop problem and we came up with an OKN square time algorithm for solving the problem. Now, in this video, I'll slowly walk you through the idea of optimizing this algorithm in a hopefully intuitive way. So, let's get started. We used inductive reasoning, or reasoning using an example, in the last video to generalize the problem and derive a recurrence for dpnk, which is the minimum of the number of moves needed to find floor f with certainty using k eggs. We derived that dpnk is equal to 1 plus the minimum of i between 1 and n of the maximum of dpi minus 1, k minus 1, and dp n minus i k. Now, when you're dealing with dp involving min max or max min relationship, a useful idea is to fix some variables and try to draw the recurrence relationship with respect to the non fixed variables. This helps you to understand the dynamic programs visually and give you an immense intuition about the problem. So, which variables are varying in this recurrence? Well, we have small n, small k, and small i as the three variables. So, let us start by fixing just two of them, say n and k. What I mean by fixing is, imagine you filled them with some numbers, say n equals 5 and k equals 2. The main idea is to stop thinking of them as variables that vary and more like numbers, like 3 or 4. Alright, so we've fixed n and k. The only variable left is small i. So what we'll do is to try to understand the recurrence visually by plotting it with respect to the varying i variable. So I'll first plot my axes, and I'll put i as the x-axis. Now let us try to draw this recurrence part by part. The first term in the recurrence is dp i minus 1, k minus 1. Now remember, k is fixed, so we can think of k minus 1 as just any other number. However, as you vary i, the value of dp i minus 1, k minus 1 changes. Now take a minute and think about how the value of dp i minus 1, k minus 1 changes as you increase i. Simply use the definition of dpi minus 1, k minus 1 to deduce this. Now, if you spend enough time, I'm sure you can see what is happening. As you increase i, you have access to the same fixed number of eggs, k minus 1 in this case. However, as i increases, i minus 1 also increases, which means that you're searching over more and more floors. But intuitively, if you have the same number of eggs, but the number of floors that you must search over is increasing, then that also means that the number of moves that takes you to find floor F with certainty either increases or at least stays the same. In other words, dpi minus 1, k minus 1 is non-decreasing as i increases. Similarly, try to think about dp n minus i k. Take a minute and think about its behavior as i increases for fixed k. Now, if you're following so far, I'm sure you can deduce the same thing. Since k is fixed, the number of eggs we have access to doesn't change with i. However, as i increases, n minus i decreases, which means that as i increases, we're searching over fewer and fewer floors. This means that dp n minus i k, or the number of moves required to find f in n minus i floors with k eggs, either decreases or stays the same. In other words, it's non-increasing. Next, the recurrence takes the maximum of both curves, or the upper envelope of both curves. 
This is the curve in purple I'm showing you here. Finally, the last step is to find the eye that minimizes this purple curve. Well, it just so happens that I star is actually the intersection of dp i minus 1 k minus 1 and dp n minus i k. In other words, for fixed n and k, the whole recurrence can be worded as finding the intersection of dp i minus 1 k minus 1 and dp n minus i k. Now, before discussing the dynamic programming speedup, let us zoom in a bit on the region of the intersection in the curve and consider the different scenarios of the intersection. There are essentially two and only two possible scenarios for the region of intersection. The first scenario happens if the intersection of dp i minus 1 k minus 1 and dp n minus i k happens at an integer coordinate i star. In this case, the minimum of the maximum of the two curves happens precisely at i star. The second scenario is a bit more complicated. It happens if the intersection of the two curves happens at a non-integral coordinate, like in this case on the right. In this case, if you look at the minimum of the maximum of the two curves, you will notice that the minimum i star is either the coordinate just before the intersection point or just after the intersection point. These points correspond to i star and i star plus 1 in the diagram. Since the maximum of the two curves at i star is less than the maximum of the two curves at i star plus 1, then we would choose i star as the global minimum of the purple curve, as any i before i star would have a bigger value, and any i after i star would have a bigger value. Make sure you understand the distinction between these two cases, as they will be very important when writing the dynamic programming speedup. All right, we're now ready to discuss the dynamic programming speedup. Remember that our objective is to find the intersection point of both dp i minus 1 k minus 1 and dp n minus i k in a time faster than o of n. Can you think of a way to use binary search to do that? Take a minute and think how you can use the monotonicity of dp i minus 1 k minus 1 and dp n minus i k to find their intersection very quickly. Now, I'm sure if you spend enough time, you would get the idea of the binary search. We will start by setting l equals 1 and r equals n. We will then look in the middle of this interval, or l plus r over 2. If we find that dp mid i minus 1 k minus 1 or the yellow curve at i equals mid is greater than dp n minus mid k, or the green curve at i equals mid, then we would know that the intersection point is to the left of mid, and so we would update our search interval to l mid. If we find the yellow curve is smaller than the green curve, then we would know that the intersection point is to the right of mid, so we would update the search interval to be mid r. If we reach a case where the two curves are equal, then we've found our index i star, and we can update the search interval to be mid mid, as mid is the index we're searching for. Now, notice that in every step, the search interval we have halves in length, So we start with an interval of length n, then n over 2, then n over 4, then n over 8, and so on. So after log n iterations, our interval would roughly be of constant size, or O of 1. So this step takes O of log n to finish the search. Here's what the pseudocode looks like. I'll leave the recurrence as well as the diagram here to help you get a better idea of the algorithm. First, we'll initialize a 2D array of size n plus 1 by k plus 1. 
we will handle the base cases of DPI0 and DP0J as discussed in part 1 of this series. Next, we will loop over all possible K and N. Once K and N are fixed, we can start the binary search to find the intersection of DPI-1 K-1 and DPN minus I K. We initialize L equals 1 and R equals small n, then do binary search over the interval until R minus L is bigger than or equal to 2. This means that the binary search would terminate if and only if R minus L is less than or equal to 1. This happens only if R equals L or R equals L plus 1. In other words, as long as L and R are not equal, or L and R are separated by more than one index, we will continue to binary search. Inside the binary search, we calculate the mid, then check if the yellow curve is above the green curve at mid, then update the interval to L mid if the yellow curve is below the green curve, and update it to mid R otherwise. Otherwise, the yellow curve and green curves must be equal, and so we set the interval to L equals R equal to mid. Once we exit the binary search loop, there is two scenarios, either L equals R, or L R equals L plus 1, where the intersection is between L and R. In this case, we would need to evaluate the maximum of the two curves at L as well as R and choose the one which minimizes the curve more as the correct answer. Notice that the line calculating dp n k in the end does exactly that. It plugs in both L and R into the maximum of the two curves formula and then takes the minimum of both these values. Luckily, this also handles the case of L equals R, as the two terms inside the min operations would be equal. Once the loops are finished, we can finally return the value saved in dp capital N capital K as the final answer. This algorithm takes OKN log N time and OKN space. Thank you for watching the video. This is part two of the super egg drop problem. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to like and subscribe to the channel. Also, if you're feeling rather generous, I'll leave a link to my Patreon in the description. I'll see you in the next video.